All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. If this is your first time to the channel, welcome. If not, welcome back. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson. Now my goal in creating this YouTube channel, ICU Advantage, was to try and provide you guys with some of the best critical care online and really free education that's out there. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys. And if you'd really be interested in more of this critical care content, then please subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure and hit that bell icon, that way you'll never miss out on a new lesson. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into our lesson here. This is going to be the fifth lesson in the CRT Explained series. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about anticoagulation. There are a couple guiding principles as well as a couple main anticoagulants that we might use. And so my goal in this lesson is to try and break them down so that you guys have a good understanding of what we're doing with them. And so let's start off and talk about why it is that we anticoagulate. The whole purpose for using anticoagulation is going to be to maintain longer filter run times. It's that simple. So if our filter is clotting, we're losing efficiency, as well as when it actually clots off, there's a period of time in which the therapy is just not going to be running. Now, typically the provider is going to build in a buffer to our flow rates and really the targeted therapy rates to try and account for this downtime. But ultimately, the less it's down, the lighter that we can really run the therapy. And at its core, the problem is related to clotting which is typically going to be the result of platelet activation, uh, as well as activation of the clotting cascade, and then ultimately the obstruction of those hollow membrane fibers in the CRT filter. As a result of this, our anticoagulation therapies are going to be aimed at interfering with this clotting cascade. There are obviously risks to using anticoagulation, and the risk must be weighed against the possible benefits, and then we have to monitor closely in our patients. So with the why we anticoagulate out of the way, let's talk about some of our strategies for anticoagulation. And when we talk about these strategies, there's three main strategies that we can use. The first strategy is going to be no anticoagulation. The second strategy is going to be our systemic anticoagulation. And then the last of these strategies is our regional anticoagulation. Now the main benefit of our no anticoagulation strategy is that it's going to be useful in situations where our anticoagulation might be contraindicated. Some examples of these contraindications, although not an exhaustive list, are going to be things like our trauma or post-surgical patients, patients who have head bleeds, and patients who have known bleeding, although this one sometimes is not always a contraindication, patients who have liver failure, as well as sepsis with coagulopathy. Now the major downside to a no anticoagulation strategy is really going to be the life of the filter, which is often pretty poor. And as discussed, the less downtime we have, the better this is. This may also require greater pre-dilution replacement rates, which is also going to decrease our efficiency. And the other potential downside is if the filter completely clots off and we're not able to return the blood while it's still safe, then almost a half a unit of blood is going to be lost. Now, if this is happening frequently, obviously this can lead to need for transfusion for patients. Now, for our systemic anticoagulation strategy, we're either going to want to anticoagulate our patient through the syringe pump on the CRT machine with heparin or systemically given to the patient with heparin or other drug options. Now, this strategy is often going to be useful in patients who require systemic anticoagulation already, and examples of this would be patients with mechanical heart valves or if they have a DVT or a PE, where we're going to need to give them systemic anticoagulation anyways, and our CRT is just going to benefit from that. This strategy, though, has the highest risk of bleeding and is also going to be impacted by the patient's own coagulation status. Now, if we are using a drug that has a reversal agent, the doses of those reversal drugs may be impacted by the filtering of that drug from the CRT filter. Main takeaway here, though, is the filter life is going to be extended, but with the increased risk of bleeding for our patient. Now, as far as the drugs that you might give to your patient systemically, there's really two main groups that you might give. The first is going to be either heparin or low molecular weight heparin, although Lovenox really is not often used for this. And the other is going to be our direct thrombin inhibitors, and this is going to be either our bivalrudin or our gatraban or other medications of that class. Now, of these, heparin is going to be the most commonly used one. And this one has the ease of monitoring and dosage adjustments. It is easy to reverse with protamine, but we do need to monitor these patients for HIT. And if their platelets start falling, then we're going to need to stop it. Now for our direct thrombin inhibitors, we don't have reversal agents for these, so FFP can be helpful as well as cryo and other clotting factors, but there is no risk for HIT. 
Now for our regional anticoagulation. This one is probably the most common one that you're gonna come across. And there are several studies out there to show that this one is safe and effective. Now with this strategy, there's actually gonna be less risk for bleeding and we can use it in some patients who have known bleeding or bleeding risk factors. Ultimately, our filter life is gonna be extended with a lower risk. Now this strategy though is gonna require closer monitoring of our patients. Now when it comes to using this strategy, there's actually gonna be three main drugs that we do. The first one is gonna be heparin and combination of protamine. Now in order to understand this one a little bit better, I'm gonna bring up the diagram that we had of our CRT circuit and blood flow. Again, this is just the real basic minimal setup here. So in order to use heparin protamine in this regional anticoagulation strategy, heparin is given pre-filter and then protamine is going to be given post-filter to reverse the anticoagulation. So looking down on our diagram, we're going to have our heparin that is going to be infused into the blood after it's drawn from the patient, but before it gets to the filter. And then the protamine is gonna be going post-filter back into the blood just before it returns to the patient. And then the goal is that the dose of protamine is gonna be enough of a dose to be able to reverse the effects of however much heparin you've given. And essentially the way it works is for every 100 units of heparin that you give, you're gonna be giving one gram of protamine. The next drug to use here is actually gonna be our citrate calcium combo. And trisodium citrate is becoming more and more popular. Now in order to understand how this combination is actually beneficial here is the citrate actually binds with calcium, which is a key player in almost all parts of the clotting cascade. Now once the calcium is bound, the citrate is no longer activated. And so what we do here is, again, looking at our diagram, we're gonna be giving the citrate pre-filter, just like we did with the heparin-protamine combo. And then most of the unbound citrate is actually gonna be removed via the filtering process. But what we do then is we then infuse calcium post-filter, and this can either be in the return line going back to the patient or just giving it to the patient systemically in order to ensure that they have adequate systemic levels of calcium. And so here we're not gonna be reversing the effects of the citrate, it's just we've now depleted the calcium from the blood being bound with that citrate that's no longer active, so we have to replenish that calcium back to the patient so that it's available for many different things, one of those being used in the clotting cascade. So this is actually very similar to how blood products work. They actually put citrate in red blood cells in order to be able to store them without clotting. And so that's why if you've ever had a patient who's been bleeding out from GI bleed, surgery gone bad, maybe a trauma patient that's not doing well, and you've given them lots and lots of blood, after so many units of blood, you have to give them that amp of calcium because there's that citrate in the blood, which is going to be binding up all that calcium that the patient normally has. And you're going to be working against yourself because you're just going to continue to bleed because now you're anticoagulating the patient. Now, sodium citrate is actually going to be metabolized into sodium bicarbonate, which can actually benefit our patients who have metabolic acidosis. If you do want to understand that a little bit better, I'm going to link to an ABG lesson here that talks more about that. The great thing here with sodium citrate is it has equal efficacy to heparin with much less risk. And the way that we monitor patients when using this strategy is that we're going to evaluate both a post-filter as well as a patient ionized calcium. And so here what I'm talking about is we're going to draw blood just after it goes through the filter and then check an ionized calcium level and we should see it be critically low at this point because hopefully that calcium has been all bound up by the citrate. So here on this post-filter if our ionized calcium is too high, this means we're not binding enough of that calcium, we're going to have to increase our citrate infusion rate and vice versa if it's too low. Then we're going to go over here to our patient and then draw a patient ionized calcium. And here we're targeting for normal calcium level. So if it's too low, the patient doesn't have enough calcium, so we're going to have to increase the rate of our calcium infusion and then again vice versa if it's too high. So again, really important that you have close monitoring of the patients when you're using this strategy because we want to ensure, one, that we have enough anticoagulation in order to get that increased longevity out of the filter, but we also really need to be monitoring our patient to ensure that they have the proper calcium level because that's really going to be important to them and their body processes as well as reducing that risk of bleeding. And then finally, the last drug group that I want to talk about real quickly is going to be our prostacyclins. So this is going to be like our EPO, 
Now, I can say I personally have never seen these ones given, but I have seen them mentioned in some literature, so I did want to make quick mention of them here. And our prostacyclins are actually platelet inhibitors and antithrombotic. They have a very short half-life of only about 30 minutes, but they are potent vasodilators, and if they're not dosed properly, it can lead to worsening hypotension in shock patients, which is going to be pretty common in patients who are on CRT, as well as it can lead to cerebral edema. And with this, there does come the risk for thrombocytopenia. Like I said, though, I've, I've never personally seen this one, so I really don't have much experience in being able to speak much more to it than that. All right, so those were our strategies for anticoagulation. As you can see, there's three really different strategies. Either we're not going to anticoagulate them, or we're going to give them systemic anticoagulation. So we're going to get the, the benefit of the preserved filter life, but also the risk for bleeding because our patient is also anticoagulated. And then we have this beauty of the regional anticoagulation where we can still provide anticoagulation as it's going through the filter, but then give them either protamine if we're giving heparin, or give them calcium to replace the calcium that's bound up by the citrate, and still get that preserved filter life without the risk of bleeding. So hopefully this stuff made sense for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please go down below, leave me a like. It really goes a long way to help support this channel. As well as leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought or have any questions that you might have. Uh, I always enjoy reading the comments and I try to respond to every single person who, who leaves a comment on here. Also, if you think other people might find this lesson useful, please share this lesson as well. A special shout out here to our awesome YouTube members and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys provide really allows me to focus more time and energy on this channel and will allow me to continue to do bigger and better things for this channel here. So a big thank you to you guys. If any of you guys would be interested in how you might be able to show support as well as get some extra perks that go along with it, you can either join the YouTube channel down below or go to the Patreon page and, and check out what some of those, those perks are. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure and do so so that you don't miss out on the next lesson that's going to be coming out in this series. In the meantime, though, make sure and check out a couple really awesome videos that I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.